I'd like to talk about convolution, and I'm going to talk about it in a, in a general sense first, and then I want to get into what I might be looking at for, for more of a discrete time case as an example how we would look at this process. Now, the beautiful part about convolution is that it is in a way for me to solve any sort of linear system, particularly we're looking at time invariant, linear time invariant systems, to an arbitrary waveform by basically going to decompose the input signal into several impulse functions. And you might imagine that there is a sense of an impulse response where you have an impulse either in discrete time or in continuous time. The discrete time is usually a little bit easier to digest because it's a single, it's a single sort of thing, a single sample. Where in continuous time, it's this weird, almost you know, infinite impulse at an infinitesimally small time. Um, the difference between the two is very much trying to understand the difference between discrete structures and continuous valued structures. That's a deeper conversation. But either way, I get an interesting output, either h of t or h of n out of that. And so that could be, for example, a boxcar filter, uh, maybe of several simps. So I would put in an impulse of, of, of delta of n, and I'm going to get some impulse out. Um, that's going to give me basically seven samples between 0 and 6. And so I would get something like that. I could imagine getting this. Well, here's the thing. I can take any input signal and I can decompose it as to a set of impulses, either discrete time or continuous time. Not as hard to see in discrete time initially because you can imagine having a whole bunch of input, everything is built out of a whole bunch of impulses or a whole bunch of these steps. So yeah, okay, I'm just adding them together. In continuous time, it's very similar, but it's the same question as um, if I'm like looking at derivatives of each impulse is, infin is each infinitesimal of the continuous waveform. So there's infinitely more of them, and it's a continuous thing, and that's a little bit different, different property. But the cool part is that convolution enables any of these to be solved with arbitrary input. That's really cool. So in the discrete case, we're going to talk about it, and we use convolution as the star operation. And y would then simply end up being, basically, you would take um, all of your coefficients, and you look at a delayed version of x. So you're basically sh moving and shifting things over. In continuous time, it's, it's always a little more complicated. By the way, they are also, um, you, you can also swap the order, right? So that property is in place. The convolution of h of t and x of t is the same as x of t and h of t. Yay, nice that we have that. Um, but it basically allows, you basically are taking sort of your input and then you're going against a transfer function and, and sort of time shifting it to give your response, or you can look at it the opposite way. Again, that, that property is available. But what you're going to see is that this is a discrete version. It's a little bit easier to see that, right? Because I'm going to take this whole structure for x equal x at, at n equals 0, and then I'm going to then take x and multiply it by everything at n equals 1 and n equals 2 and so on. So let's talk about a little more practical uh, sort of thing just to visualize it. Just the discrete time, I think, is easier to understand and visualize. The continuous time does very similar sort of thing, but you're taking it and sort of flipping it and rotating and moving through. So what you're going to do here with your input is you're going to say, well, here's my x of t is maybe 1, 2, 2, 1. You would represent this as a set of delta functions, four of them in this particular case n, n minus 1, n, 2, n, n minus 3. And imagine I'm going to use a three input boxcar filter, so all three of them have um, the size of 1. So the total, maybe there's a gain of 3 in this. And so that's how I'd represent these three inputs. And you say, okay, well, if I take this input going into this linear system, which is represented by this impulse response h of n, so in other words, if I had just put a single input of size 1 in, I would have gotten just 1, 2, 3 as my initial input. I put that into this graph bar and I go, oh, look what I'm going to get. This is a convolution of the two. And the response gives me sort of 1, 3, 5, 5, 3, 1. And you're like, cool. Um, and so I could, have, I could do that by simply going through and evaluating this function for these, for these pieces. Here is one thing that's very useful when you start trying to do these convolutions, is you realize, ah, two impulse convolution. If I, in, if I convolve an impulse with an impulse, I get an impulse, right? And 
here's the thing. I basically type this one in equals 2, and I take this one in equals 5. I simply shifted it. Um, so I've simply shifted it by the number of steps that I'm working with. So you think, oh, okay, that gives me something of which so I've taken one that's two away and one that's three away, and now it becomes five. And you're like, oh, that makes sense um, in some general sense of it. So now, what's the way to think about it? Well, y of n could really be thought of saying, well, I have a whole set of impulses for y of n for here. I have a whole set of impulses for y for x of n. That's your h of n. That's your x of n. Take the two set of them, and I can simply multiply them out. Well, the one that's delta of n and delta of n, that just gives me delta of n. And you think, well, that's not too bad, except that you know now I've got two polynomials, and I'm multiplying out the polynomials. But we know how to do this. This is something that is a straightforward operation. And you know the delta of n and one n, I multiply all of those, I get a whole set of these, plus I get a whole other one for n minus one, and multiply by 2, a whole bunch of n minus 2 multiply by 2, and a whole bunch of n minus 3 multiply by 1. Take all those elements, and maybe you'd like to build a table to add them up. Depends on what works for you, on how you do this. And this is the kind of result you would get, which of course you can come up here. What's also nice is there are direct functions in places like MATLAB to directly solve these functions should you need it. And this is great because now this gives us a whole direct way to sort of method have a methodical way to solve this. You might also realize that talking about convolution and finding numerical ways to solve it also gives us ways to multiplying polynomials and looking at a whole range of things there. But what's useful is this gives me a way to solve any discrete or continuous function and come up with sort of these solutions that I'm going to need um, for any arbitrary input, whether it be discrete time or continuous time.